Hi there. Chinese trade and investment is the focus of this short video for A2 Macro. So if we take a look at China's share of world trade, it's increased from 2% in 1990 to 7% in 2001 when it joined the World Trade Organization, or WTO. And by 2013, China's share of world uh, exports, world, world trade, had risen to 13%. Now that, of course, is the, the overall figure. Within that, there are some significant variations. So, for example, last year, China exported over half of global computer equipment and nearly two-thirds of global plastic toys. If you look at the chart on the, on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see the long-term increase in market share in aspects such as furniture, footwear, apparel, textiles, plastic toys. China both scaling up and then exploiting her comparative advantage in fairly low labour cost, labour intensive manufactured goods. But actually in recent times, their share in those labour intensive final goods has started to decline. Indeed, there's been a shift of production out of China towards lower wage cost countries such as Bangladesh, Laos, Cambodia, Indonesia and Vietnam. By some estimates, wages in those countries are only three to four times lower than they are in Chinese manufacturing at the moment. So there's been a big shift in comparative advantage. This chart comes from Cesar Hidalgo's wonderful work at the Index of Observatory of Economic Complexity, and it shows the basic uh, breakdown of Chinese exports. This was to, for 2014. In total, China exported over $2.37 trillion worth of exports, and nearly half of them were categorised as machines. Uh, textiles, 11%, that's now falling. Metals, miscellaneous goods. So China is essentially the world's biggest industrial exporter. And that pattern will change in recent in years to come as China tries to move up the value chain and move into slightly less labour intensive, more higher value added products. And these are the products that China imports. They are a net import, of course, of crude oil and iron and copper from countries such as Zambia. Uh, they're a major import of integrated circuits, uh, circuits for telephones, computers, what have you, semiconductors. Typically, for example, they might uh, import the circuits and the semiconductors from a country such as South Korea and then assemble the final product for re-export. So China essentially has a much more variegated import structure, as you would expect, of course, given its stage of development. Here are China's main export trade partners. The, in 2015, uh, the biggest trade partner was the United States, followed closely by the European Union and then Hong Kong. ASEAN, of course, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which includes Malaysia and Thailand and Vietnam, they account for 12% of total Chinese trade, Japan less than 6% and South Korea less than 5%. Russia and India uh, barely figure in terms of the biggest Chinese export markets. Now, in recent times, China, of course, has been developing uh, new trade and investment policies. Uh, in recent years, China's concluded a lot of bilateral, in other words, two-country free trade agreements involving the gradual dismantling of tariffs and non-tariff barriers. So, for example, the most recent free trade agreements were with Australia and South Korea in 2015, one with Switzerland two years ago, and a whole number of other uh, free trade agreements. China has not signed the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but in fact has free trade agreements with a, a number of member countries. Over recent years, one of the big issues has been the size and scale of China's trade and current account surplus. I just wanted to update you on this. If you follow the red line here, this shows China's current account balance as a percentage of GDP. Don't forget the current account, of course, is the balance in goods and services and the net balance of primary and secondary income. And you can see that in 2007, China was running an absolutely enormous current account surplus in excess of 10% of GDP, and that amounted to a current account surplus of over $350 billion. But the big story and the big news to take away from this slide is that China's current account surplus has dropped dramatically from over 10%, effectively 9 or 10 years ago, to just over 2% in 2015. But of course, given that the size of the Chinese economy is being growing so quickly, 8, 9, 10% per year, a 2% current account surplus these days is almost sufficient to generate a $300 billion current account surplus in absolute size. Whereas in 2000 and, uh, 2007, a 10% current account surplus generated a surplus of $350, $15 billion. So the, the, the enormous size of the Chinese economy means that a current account surplus of just 2% of their national income 
equates to current account surpluses of many hundreds of billions of dollars. One of the consequences of China's enormous surpluses year on year and, uh, part, and also the consequence of their exchange rate policy has been the accumulation of enormous foreign currency reserves. We normally track this uh, measured in US dollars and you can see that China's currency reserves shot up from $500 billion in 2005 to touching just over $4 trillion in 2014-2015. Uh, they have been falling recently. There's been a decline in foreign currency reserves. That's partly because of uh, some private sector capital flight from nervous investors in China. But uh, the true scale of those Chinese currency reserves is enormous. China being a current account surplus country can afford to be a capital exporter. And indeed, this is what's happened. Lots of Chinese companies are now investing more overseas. So here are some really good examples of recent outward investment from China. FDI, either in physical manufacturing capacity and infrastructure and projects or in terms of mergers and takeovers. Chem China has been right at the top. In the last couple of years, they've spent over $40 billion to acquire the Swiss agrochemical and seeds company Syngenta. That's a major acquisition. Just two years ago, they spent nearly $10 billion to buy the high-class Italian tyre company Pirelli. Dalian Wanda, uh, a Chinese um, media firm, has just bought US film studio Legendary Entertainment, the company that made Jurassic Park, and it's also bought a chain of cinemas in the States for just a billion dollars. And you can see some other examples here. China General Nuclear Power Corporation has got a one-third interest now in the, in the proposed nuclear power project for Hinkley Point in the UK. Huawei Technologies opening an ICT training innovation centre in Sydney that will presumably train up to 2,000 engineers every year. Alibaba, under the leadership of Jack Ma, spending millions of dollars opening three cloud data centres in Hong Kong, Singapore and Silicon Valley. So what you can see here is that China is trying to change its growth pattern. It's using some of its surplus dollars to uh, and funding FDI to buy both experience, technology, well-established brands and high-quality human capital. It's all part of their strategy to become more competitive in the higher value-added growth industries of the future. It's part of their new growth strategy to move away from labour-intensive manufacturing towards, you could argue, higher-quality uh, premium priced manufacturing and service industries. Okay, so that's been a quick look at some aspects of Chinese trade and investment.